And uh, our last speaker is uh, uh, Professor Joao Pedro de Maguilares, uh, who is with the Genomics of Aging and Rejuvenation Lab, Institute of Inflammation and Aging, University of Birmingham. If it's out of date, please correct me. And, um, and uh, he will speak about prospects, problems, and pitfalls in developing aging therapeutics. So, Joao, please. Thank you. Yes, hi. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you, Didier. So let me scare, share my screen. Um, yeah, so thank you. So I'll, I'll start with a brief introduction, and then I will, um, uh, I, I suppose, provide a, an overview of some of the advances, in particularly at the level of pharmacological interventions in aging, but also some of the problems, some, some, some issues we have, some difficult issues we have, in my opinion, uh, and also briefly some of the work we've, we've been doing. So, so let me, um, brief introduction, I think quite a few of you know me already, but just so those who don't, um, I mean, I, I work on aging essentially um, because when I was a child, I, I figured that we have to overcome aging. I, 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 it's, um, it's really um, the major cause of death in modern societies. And so, so I decided back when I was a child, there's a photo of me as a child, that I wanted to cure aging and that's what I would spend my career doing. So, so that's, I'm not saying that's, that's easy or even it's possible within a foreseeable future, but that's, that's the ultimate goal. That's what I, you know, what, what I do my work is with that goal in mind. And that's important for some of the issues or some of the discussion I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, so, so, so with that in mind, um, as Ilya mentioned, I've recently moved to the University of Birmingham. So I'm now based in, uh, I was in Liverpool for quite a long time, and now I'm at the University of Birmingham, Institute of Inflammation and Aging. Um, and so, so our lab in Birmingham, we do quite a few things that I don't have time to go into detail on any, everything, but uh, we do various computational genomic approaches. We do evolutionary analysis. We have some focuses on cell models, animal, well, long-lived models. Um, but most of what I'll focus today will be more on at the level of uh, uh, in interventions, in particular pharmacological interventions in aging. And that's what uh, mostly I'll talk about and, and also some of the computational methods we've been working on. So, so in this context, as I'm sure you're aware, there's been a lot of excitement in the field. There's been a lot of advances. I mean, this is from, um, uh, from, from a paper uh, I did last year on the number of drugs associated with longevity in model systems. And as you can see, there's this huge exponential growth in longevity drugs. Um, so it's quite remarkable. I mean, the field is exploding. There's lots of lots of uh, longevity drugs. It is quite an exciting time to work on longevity pharmacology. So uh, one of the things we've developed, and I mentioned this uh, uh, you know, previously in this, in this conference, is the, it's called the Drug Edge Database of Age-Related Drugs. So this is a compilation of uh, uh, hundreds of studies um, uh, from manipulations of longevity in model systems uh, using drugs or compounds. And uh, the current version um, has over a thousand drugs or compounds that increase lifespan in at least one model system. So again, it's quite remarkable how much we are advancing in the field in the context of longevity manipulations uh, using pharmaco pharmacological methods. So having said it, I mean, when you look, when you dig a deep, deep deeper into, into the data, uh, one of the things we did, uh, we published earlier this year with Alex Moskalev and others, was when you look at the most studied drugs, uh, across model systems, which is these drugs here, so you, you see actually quite a, a, a very large spread in terms of longevity effects and differences between drugs. So let me show you a couple of examples. So what you see here are the, the major longevity drugs uh, in terms of number of studies we have in drug age. Um, and this is the average lifespan change across, mm -hmm. so sort of a meta-analysis of the different uh, studies for each of those drugs. So when you look, for example, at resveratrol, there are studies that show an increase in lifespan in resveratrol, but there's some that show a decrease in. And, and actually, the average is very close to zero uh, when you take into consideration all of the studies. Uh, by contrast, rapamycin, um, you do see that the average, or, or when you do this meta-analysis type, is that there is an, an increase uh, in lifespan when you take all of these results combined. So, so the point is that there's a lot of studies. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. Um, and uh, it's important to take into consideration these differences between uh, different studies. 
Uh, and for some compounds, that doesn't appear to be a strong effect like resveratrol. For others, like rapamycin, there seems to be a significant impact on longevity. Now, there's something else I wanted to point out here as well, which is when you look at the effect sizes, so when you look at the lifespan effects, they're not very big. Uh, we're talking 10, 5, 10% increase in lifespan. Um, I mean, even rapamycin, I think, well, it depends on whether males or females, but it, it's about 10, 15% maximum in rodents. Uh, and this is data from across systems. So when you look in rodents, mice in particular, you don't see very big effects in terms of longevity. Um, for example, by comparison, caloric restriction, you see about, uh, well, depends on strains, but it's about up to 50% increase in, in lifespan that you observed in uh, at least some, some rodent strains. Uh, and that is still, the, that was discovered decades ago, and that is still the most we can extend lifespan in rodents, uh, lifespan in mammals. Um, so it's still caloric restriction. So, so pharmacological interventions have relatively modest effect sizes, which I actually think it raises uh, an important question, which is whether these longevity drugs are actually delaying aging. Now, it's very possible, I would say many of them may be improving health via aging independent mechanisms. Um, for example, to use rodents as a, as, an, as a case, mice mostly die of, of cancer. So if you have a drug that reduces cancer in mice, then it's going to extend lifespan, even, it does, even if it doesn't do anything else about any other aging phenotype. So, so that's something that I, I think it's quite a, um, or could be an issue for a lot of these longevity interventions. Maybe they impact on longevity, but they're not acting via aging mechanisms. They're acting via... Um, aging independent mechanisms by specific diseases rather than retarding the whole aging process, which is what I would like, at least. And, I mean, I'm not saying that research on cancer is not important. Of course it is. But if we want to intervene in aging, we want interventions that impact on aging and not just on cancer. So, so that's, that's the argument. Um, and then when you look at uh, the, the, the specific mechanisms targeted by most drugs, actually there, there's a relatively small number of pathways and processes being targeted. So again, I published this last year, but you know we're talking a lot of drugs target oxidative stress and mitochondria. Um, we've heard about it in this conference already. A lot of drugs target senescent cells, a lot of senolytics, uh, and quite a few drugs uh, or compounds are mediators of or trying to mimic caloric restriction um, like via mTOR, NAT+, et cetera. So there's a, a relatively narrow focus of, of anti-aging biotech. I think there's a lot of folks try going for the low-hanging fruit, um, but I, I, I would like to see a greater diversity in approaches uh, in the industry. Um, that, that, that's the point. And I, I think with that in mind, I think the other issue, I suppose, is that when you look at what we know about aging and what we don't know, the current mechanisms of aging, they could be wrong. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis um, I'm sure you're aware on the hallmarks of aging. Uh, we've heard about it in this conference. Um, but the fact is, we don't know if they're right. I mean, they're, they're, they could turn out to be wrong. We don't know if senescent cells are a driver of aging in any human tissue. There, there is simply no evidence for that. Uh, we don't know if telomere shortening is a driver of aging in any human tissue. Um, I, I think there is still a lot of unknowns in terms of what are the underlying causes of aging. So, so although there's a number of hypotheses, we don't know for sure why human beings age. So, so that is another, I think, limitation we have in a field and another challenge is that we, we still don't understand the human aging process. Uh, and so perhaps not surprisingly, I mean, there's a lot of challenges, I suppose, going from model systems and preclinical models to humans. I'm sure you're aware of, of the difficulties, not just in aging research, but in, in big pharma, in, in, in biomedical discovery in general, in growing from animal models to human clinical applications. Part of this is because of this gap in knowledge as well regarding human biology. Again, we don't understand why, why human beings age. That, that still remains a very uh, timely uh, and very big open question in the field. And as has been mentioned before as well in, in this conference, there's a lot of let's say, limitations and, and challenges um, in clinical trials. They take several years, they cost a lot of money. Um, and when you're talking about aging uh, as a phenotype, um, there's very long validation times. So, so one of the issues we have in aging is, of course, we can only, uh, not just in aging, but particularly in aging, but a, a 
bottleneck in biomedical research is clinical trials are very long and expensive. And so we can only test a, a limited number of therapies for a limited number of uh, conditions. So, so, those, so those are important limitations that are not easy to overcome, even with, with lots of funding, for instance. It doesn't matter how much money you have. A clinical trial uh, is going to take a certain amount of time. So, so there, that's, that's a very important bottleneck we have um, in research, uh, in particularly in, in a research like aging that, that takes quite a long time to develop. So, so with that in mind, I mean, we've um, in the last few minutes, I'll just briefly touch upon some of the the, the work we've been uh, developing, and um, I, I wouldn't say overcome. That would be, I think, over optimistic, but uh, trying to address or trying to help in this bottlenecks. So, one thing uh, um, that we've done quite a lot is in terms of uh, developing data driven computational. Uh, approaches and methods um, to prioritize gene targets, to prioritize genes, and to prioritize drugs, which is, well, we've done a lot on genetics as well, which I won't talk about today, but we've done a lot in terms of using data-driven approaches to prioritize drugs um, for impact on aging. Um, so, so we have a, been developing a number of computational methods, which I'll briefly uh, summarize. The goal is to reduce the number of experiments. So as I said, I mean, even in animal models, the time it takes to do an experiment uh, is not something you can overcome with money, for example. Even if you're the best funded company in the world, doesn't matter. It's still, if you wanna do a lifespan experiment in normal mice, it will still take about four years. And then there's nothing you can change about that. So, so the goal is to try to prioritize drugs uh, or, or candidates um, to reduce the number of experiments. So one thing, so I'll briefly show a couple of um, couple of uh, uh, papers and a preprint we've actually just posted a couple of days ago um, without going to a lot of details. Um, but so this is now on BioArchive. So we've just um, posted this uh, method for predicting longevity drugs using machine learning. So the way it works very briefly is we take drugs from drug age um, but then we look at their uh, gene targets. And then from those gene targets, we look at which of those are aging related genes, uh, which processes they're associated using gene ontology, which phenotypes they're associated with, which other proteins they interact with. Uh, and then we use those features to define the, the ones that are most associated with longevity. Uh, and then based on those features, we try to predict new drugs in terms of associated or candidates for associations with longevity. Um, so it's a, it's a machine learning method that we, we've just released. So um, for more details, please check out our, our preprint in BioArchive. Now, the other thing we've, we've actually started a few years back already. So, so again, I'll skip on the details, um, but we developed this, this network pharmacology um, method for um, repositioning, for drug repositioning in the context of longevity. I mean, very briefly, we've published this before, but um, very briefly, we will look at um, gene expression signatures of longevity, specific caloric restriction, and then we try to identify drugs um, that induce similar or statistically uh, overlapping um, signatures to longevity. Uh, and then we found a number of drugs, five of them we tested in C. elegans, four of which extended lifespan. So, I mean, we published this in Aging Cell in 2016. Um, the most interesting, or at least the most novel of those drugs was Alantuin. Now, Alantuin is, is actually a marker of oxidative stress, um, and it's used in anti-aging skin creams. Um, uh, but we were the first to show it extends longevity uh, and health span as well in worms. So, so we were interested. Okay, so how can we uh, take this further? Now, Alantuin, for various reasons, has that, well, in terms of bioavailability in humans, there's some issues in mammals even. Uh, and so we decided to focus on another um, compound called Rilmanidine. And, and so very briefly, I'll tell you what we've been doing. So again, it's not been published, but it's a it's a preprint on bioarchive. So Rilmanidin is used as an oral antihypertensive drug. So it has relatively um, uh, rare and non-severe side effects. So it's already used in a clinic, um, but we tested it in C. elegans as well. So we showed it extends lifespan. Um, so what you see here is a survival of animals, um, a different dosages. So about 200 micromolar was, was the optimal um, and it extends lifespan whether you feed animals in early in life or in late in life, uh, which of course is what you want if you want to apply it to older uh, individuals. 
Um, we did various mechanistic studies, which I, I won't mention, mention here. We, we found the receptor we think is involved. We created a mutant. I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but it's in the preprint. The, the point is that realmanidine is a potential new, quite interesting and promising longevity drug, given that it's already used in the clinic. It's, uh, I mean, together with, and this was done with various collaborators like Colin Hewell in, in Zurich and Vadim Gladyshev in Boston. Um, and uh, so we showed that the transcriptional changes in mice uh, fed realmanidine are similar to other life extending uh, interventions like caloric restriction. Um, and there's already uh, data from other labs on realmanidine in mouse models of the neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so there's already some evidence for well, promise, for clinical promise from mouse models. So I would argue it's a, it's a promising new new protector. I mean, of course, I take it with a grain of salt. All we've done so far is in worms. There's a big gap from worms to, to even to mammalian models and a big gap from mammalian models to humans. Um, but our goal now is uh, uh, is to, to take this to um, rodent models or mammalian models uh, and explore if this could be uh, a potential new anti-aging um, therapeutic. So, so that's, that's something that we're quite interested in exploring in the future. Um, and so with that, um, I'll just um, uh, summarize. So I've told you that we now know from, um, and it's cataloged in our drug age database, over a thousand um, drugs and compounds that can modulate longevity in model systems. Having said that, there's a lot of variation between them. Um, I, I think a big question to me is whether these longevity drugs, whether they delay aging or whether they're affecting aging independent mechanisms. To me, that's that's a big question. I think, well, as I said, you know, if, if you want to develop a, long, a drug to anti-cancer, that's fantastic. But what I think would have a bigger impact, of course, and my interest is really in delaying aging. So, so, and I, I'm, I have my doubts whether most of these longevity drugs are actually delaying aging. Um, I told you as well that, that we have a lot of bottlenecks in the field, like long validation times, lack of mechanistic understanding of aging. Um, so there's still a, a number of problems. Um, but on the bright side, I've mentioned some of the in silico computational methods we've been developing, uh, trying to, to predict and prioritize uh, compounds um, in the context of aging and longevity. Uh, and lastly, I have to mention this uh, new potential geroprotector. Well, it is a geroprotector in worms, we can say that, um, called remanidine, which is already used in the clinic to, uh, sorry, to treat uh, hypertension and would have um, potential uh, for, for further discoveries. So thank you very much. I mean, this is actually my 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 lab is uh, and my office is in the hospital. This is Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Uh, if you're if you're nearby, feel free to drop me a line for a visit. And and um, I should also mention that we are recruiting um, PhD students. Uh, we'll have a postdoc position advertised uh, probably next week. So if any of this is of interest, please feel free to drop me an email. And uh, well, if we, if we have time for questions, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. Yes, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, so um, uh, I know, uh, Eduard, do you want to ask yourself directly in your own voice? Uh, okay, so hello. Uh, so as understanding aging is complex and therefore predictions are very uncertain, wouldn't it mostly make sense to massively test in parallel many of the promising things that you described in Daphnia and in mice, for example? So, I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, I'm all in favor of doing large scale testing. Um, uh, I, I suppose the big bottleneck is just costing, you know, it's, it's, um, we have been involved somewhat in, um, in the ITP program, the interventions testing program of the NIA. We had, well, we had a, a fish oil actually accepted into it. Um, and it's a fantastic program, but it is quite expensive. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars per compound being tested. Um, so, so there's only a certain number of compounds that can be tested. So I, I suppose that's the big bottleneck is, is, um, is having the funds to do this parallel experiments, as you say. But I mean, from a <laughs> biological perspective, I'm all for it. Because for aging, as you know, in the 2000s, uh, this was done in six elegant uh, with uh, RNA uh, screenings. Um, and uh, this is how we identified 
axis of longevity in C. elegans and how after looking a bit around what worked to make them live 50%, uh, then twice, then 10 times, then 30 times longer. And I think this is the missing approach uh, for uh, uh, based on the knowledge we have today. Of course, there are many other ways. If you can understand, that's fine. But I think this has changes to work. So, and yeah, and uh, maybe I will say last thing, uh, just a side remark. Each time I hear that uh, mice uh, I can't live more than, let's say, 30%. I remember the work by Bartke and Roux, uh, where he used the uh, Ames dwarf mice uh, and added the uh, cardiac restriction. And I think he reached a 70% uh, life extension. I know that it's not uh, at all what we look for because it's uh, it doesn't work. That's the work from uh, Holly Brown, I think. Um, uh, when it, start, it started with a mutation later in age, it doesn't work as well. But the biggest life extension I am know of is seventy percent. Yes. Okay. Well, I think, but I think that's just very briefly. I mean, I think that's a good um, good point. But then that's, I think. That is the the I, I suppose the difference between you know doing caloric restriction or genetic manipulations where you see a lot uh, or, or you in some cases you greater lifespan extension than in pharmacological approaches. We um, you know that that's the amounts of the effect sizes we see with compounds and drugs is still much smaller. That's that's I, I think that's the problem because that's the way for human translation. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Aubrey, you wanted to also comment and uh, ask a question? Sure, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was just being a, a bit of a nuisance in my comment, but my question is, um, uh, would you agree that if a, an intervention extends maximum lifespan in mice, for example, then it is much, much more likely to be affecting aging than if it only extends mean lifespan? So that's a that's a very good question. We've done a bit of work on that actually. We published an article in in genetics, not on pharmacological interventions, but genetic m manipulations of aging, and looking at demographic aging rates, average lifespan, maximum lifespan. I would say yes, it's more likely if it extends lifespan, but it's not a given. So just because an intervention extends maximum lifespan, particularly if the effect sizes are small, I wouldn't say by itself it proves that it's retarding aging. Um, uh, to me, the effect sizes are quite important, I, I would say. So, so yes, I, I would agree, uh, but not uh, <laughs> to some degree, I would agree, but I wouldn't say that's, uh, you know, yes or no. I think that there's a bit of a gray area there as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more question from uh, Ole Lufchak. Uh, is it possible to predict additive or synergistic effects of anti-aging drugs with AI? Um... Yes, but it's not a hundred percent accurate. So, so for example, when we we, you know, we do our machine learning approaches, for example, um, it can help. I mean, we can have we have predictive models that are better than just random, but they're not a hundred percent accurate. I, I suppose that's one of the problems of biology, and it, it's really really complicated. And it is really really difficult to make very accurate predictive models. So, yes, you can build predictive models with AI and machine learning. Uh, for for longevity effects or for even other phenotypes, um, in a lot of cases they're better than just random predictions, but they're not hundred percent accurate. So you still need to go and do some experiments and prove that we are your predicting is actually is actually true. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we'll have uh, one last question and then maybe a couple more minutes for the general round or, or uh, we'll stop there. From uh, uh, from uh, uh, Voda, from uh, Alexander and Voda, you want to ask yourself, but very briefly, Alexandru. Um, hi, yeah. So um, really cool presentation. Just wanted to ask whether, firstly, whether there's um, any supplemental figure with the ninety five percent confidence intervals on the Kaplan Mayer curves for the new drug, and then the second thing is if you can give any bits of detail about the post op position. So in terms of the first question, so yes, um, there's in the preprint 
for Realmanadin, there's uh, Excel spreadsheet with all of the lifespan curves. And so we did various lifespan experiments, not just one. We actually ended up doing nearly 100 lifespan experiments in, in total when you count, like, because we could generate a mutant and then we tested Realmanadin, we were up a mice So um, we actually ended up doing a lot of lifespan experiments. And all of that should be in the supplementary material in an Excel spreadsheet. And sorry, I forgot your second question. What was the second question? <laughs> About the post about the post opposition, if you have any details now, or if it's a project in drafting right now. So, so it's a project uh, to work on actually machine learning, uh, developing machine learning methods for predicting longevity drugs. So it's uh, mostly computational, but the project also involves uh, validation, experimental validation of the drugs. Um, so, so if you're interested, feel free to. I mean, you or anyone, if you're interested, feel free to to drop me an email. Happy to, to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the great talk, uh, for raising some of the tough Thank questions you. that we'll uh, need to deal a lot uh, for the foreseeable time. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we planned generally a, a round of, uh, of uh, questions. Uh, I think we can forego because uh, we had plenty of opportunity to ask. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, uh, maybe Patricia, if you want to ask uh, some urgent question that, uh, that you forgot to Joao Pedro, to anybody. Um, not urgent, just a comment. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's very interesting what you said about the um, <clears throat> antihypertensive drug, uh, because uh, in 2004, Nobel Prize Linda Bax published a PNS article about um, serotonin analog that was able to enhance 30% um, lifespan in C. elegans. So I think this kind of experiments have been done all over in the decades, there is a relationship between um, mood, tension in the body and longevity. This is something physically, it belongs to the structure of our body. I mean, we are also not only genes, but tensions. And I think this is an interesting uh, avenue to um, continue to look for comment. Thank you. Yes, thank you. you. Uh, yeah, thanks.